Hello, everybody. Thanks for coming. We can get started, I guess. Um, so my name is Ron Lipke. I'm a senior engineer, uh, cloud type person on the uh, platform as a service team at Gannett. Um, and I'm going to talk to you a little bit about our container journey. Full disclosure, this is my first time ever speaking at a conference. So in addition to dying a little inside right now, um, I'm also a person who stutters, or if you're from the UK, it's stammer. Uh, so if it looks like I'm rebooting up here or stalling, that's probably why. Uh, so some of you might be wondering just who or what Gannett is. Uh, we are a national news and media company with roots in the a traditional print, uh, print business. Um, we're probably most recognized by our national brand at USA Today. Uh, but we're also, we also have about 130 other local news outlets in the United States that make up the USA Today network. Um, and that brings in about 125 million unique visitors a month. These are just all the brands in USA Today a network. Maybe you grew up around one or you recognize a logo from, from where you live now. Um, so what does a platform as a service do for Gannett? Uh, we provide the central, um, the central location um, for self-service provisioning um, and, uh, and tooling for infrastructure for about 40 internal dev teams across Gannett. And that's pretty much um, where they can test and deploy and then uh, all, all the way up to up, their apps all the way up to up, uh, up production workloads. And this is all in the public cloud. Um, we do have some uh, data centers, but uh, everything on the platform is in, uh, in the public cloud. Um, so for us, not only are we, are we managing the uh, environment that runs all of, all of the USA Today apps, but our customer's dev is our prod from, from our point of view. Um, we, have a, we have a five teams um, on PaaS. I'm on the integration team, and we are responsible for architecting and maintaining the core features of the platform. Um, so the start of our con container journey uh, goes all the way into the deep annals of history uh, at the 2016 United States presidential election. Um, so basically, in the news industry, there's a two types of events that you have to plan for. There's breaking news, um, when everyone's phone is going off. Um, that ends up in a very unpredictable, yet high volume of traffic that dissipates pretty quickly. Um, and really, your defense against that is make sure all the things are, are scalable, and if they're not, run over-provisioned, uh, over which isn't the best. Um, and cache all the things. Uh, cache in front, cache in back, uh, protect your origin at all costs, and you should be able to handle uh, all those new spikes that are, seem to be happening much more frequently. Then there's events like the Super Bowl, the Olympics, um, the presidential election, which have a sustained high volume of traffic pattern, and the data footprint is, is very different because your users want the most accurate, most up-to-date information as possible. So you can't protect your origin behind those really high cache TTLs. Um, and the content and the product teams are probably going to be requesting a lot of uh, deployments to, to change how the data is being presented, um, fix any bugs or anything like that. Uh, so the faster we can do those uh, deployments and the safer we can, the more satisfied our internal and our external customers are. So this was shaping up to be the largest night of traffic in USA Today history. Um, and we figured, why not make that our first time we've run a container app? Up to this point, we had not a container on the platform. So this was, it, it was new for us. It was something that we had been considering, but really hadn't planned out yet. Um, and then our core product team came to us and said, hey, we're interested in running the elections app in a container. We said, sure. And we scoped it as kind of a stretch goal. Um, if we could run maybe five or ten percent of election night election night traffic uh, in a container, we would call that a success. Um, so we started out by creating a list of our requirements. This is just a short short list of those. Um, 
we are an old enterprise. We have a data centers all across the country, so we have a lot of legacy infrastructure um, that we needed to just be aware of that there were a dependencies here that we couldn't we couldn't engineer out of and make everything just a perfect cloud native app. Um, we really had to take advantage of our existing bootstrapping, um, our existing features on the platform to uh, bootstrap these clusters. Um, we had limited time to even do this, so we couldn't learn something new like stand up a, a, a Prometheus a cluster or something. We had to use what we were already using um, on the platform. And we're a chef shop, so we had to use chef to, uh, to bootstrap these things. Uh, auto scaling uh, was non-negotiable for nodes and containers because of the breaking news thing. Um, and we really didn't have time to like write our own, so it would be better if this was inherent in whatever we chose to use. And pretty much everything on the platform is self-service. So these uh, Kubernetes, uh, these container clusters had to be uh, in the same vein. They had to be a self-service with minimal manual steps required for a team to get started. And I went too fast. And uh, we really needed to maintain our cost boundaries and ownership uh, on these clusters. So that kind of eliminated a multi-tenancy. And at the time, a federation really wasn't like baked quite well yet. So we had to find a middle ground in there somewhere. And then, of course, we wanted to quickly iterate with the, with the community as they're moving quite fast. Um, and just keep up with requests from our users as they started to adopt containers more. So we started out and we took a whole bunch of sprint tasks, we gave them out to team members, and we said, hey, go take one of these things and POC it. Um, maybe speak with the sales team or a solutions engineering team, and then come back, demo it, and advocate for its use. Um, we all of these are great products. Um, there were things that, in and of itself, they were great, but we kept a finding that as we got a little bit down in the uh, development cycle with one, we would hit a deal breaker or just something we couldn't engineer around in the, uh, in the time that we had. Um, but this is a KubeCon, so it's no surprise that the winner was Kubernetes. That would be really awkward if it was like ECS. Um, so, a good part of the reason why we chose, we chose this is something I like to call the Kelsey Hightower effect. Um, we all know who he is. Uh, if you don't know who he is, I, I highly recommend checking out his Twitter and his GitHub accounts. Um, our Google team put us in front of Kelsey after we just kept bombarding them with questions that they were like, someone else needs to answer these. And after that meeting, we came out like really confident that Cube was, was was the choice that, that was gonna work the best for us. So just to talk about some of, of the requirements uh, I was talking about and how they informed um, our choice of Kubernetes. Uh, we probably spent a lot of time, probably the most time, on, on networking. Um, and I wanna give a shout out to my teammate Dane, who's Zooming this now for our team. <laughs> um, he was a network, engineer in a former life, so his expertise here was super, super invaluable. Um, and Q has some pretty, has some pretty like gnarly network of requirements where everything has to be able to, to see everything else without you know, the magic of NAT. And since we're running these in the public cloud, um, we really weren't comfortable with delegating uh, a cluster the ability to edit our network routes in like AWS or VCP, uh, VPC or in GCE. Um, plus there's inherent limits, you, know, you can only have about 50 routes. So we went with an overlay a network, which is pretty common. Um, we looked at Weave, we looked at Flannel, we looked at Calico. Weave we eliminated pretty early. Flannel, to be honest, we just didn't have time. We never, like it was planned that we were gonna look at it, but we just ran out of time. Um, and that was okay, because it turned out that Calico was really good a fit for us. Um, its policy management was, was a super helpful um, with our app deployment strategy, which I'll get to um, in a, a slide pretty soon. Um, IP to IP encapsulation meant we could just drop it into an already existing a VPC. We didn't have to stand up anything extra or, or reconfigure everything. 
And AWS was probably happy since we're not trying to set up a BGP routes between our clusters and their routers. And yeah, so we've, uh, we've been doing really well with picking Calico. Um, so we use Chef. Uh, it doesn't matter if you use Puppet, Ansible, a bunch of gross shell scripts. Um, this is what Scalar looks like to an end user on the platform. Um, it has a, a really great UI. It also has a really extensive API. Um, and it handles all of the creating and managing of our cloud user, uh, our cloud resources, um, and supports uh, really extensive governance of policy and role-based access. So we can empower our users, but we can also fine tune what they have access to. And Scalar runs on a, a farm paradigm. Um, so like one cube cluster would be a farm, and then within that farm on the left, you have your farm roles, and they map to the cube master, the workers, etcd, your API, a load balancer, and each of those farm roles has its own separate settings for instance size, uh, auto scaling of settings, orchestration scripts, and uh, this really worked well with for how we were envisioning our, uh, our clusters. And then kind of more on the side of non-technical challenges, um, we really had to architect uh, our cube clusters knowing that they'd be owned and provisioned by just a, a single team. Um, so that means we kind of had to automate and abstract all of the little things that a, an app team just probably doesn't want to deal with, like making sure etcd is, is backed up, um, setting our namespacing as standards up front because we were going to have a lot of teams with a lot of clusters and that was going to get really annoying soon. And uh, and automating all of the creation of the secrets needed to stand up uh, a cube cluster. But at the same time, we needed to keep in mind that even though these teams have been on platform for a while, this is probably the most complex thing they're going to be opsing. Um, and at Connect, we promote like uh, a, a culture of shared ownership, shared shared responsibility. So app teams are getting alerted on their infrastructure, like, they're, like if their worker nodes are, are getting crushed on CPU, then that alert goes to them first. So we really had to make sure that our documentation was good. Um, we really wanted to incentivize them to care. Um, and, and part of that was also eating, uh, eating our own dog food, so to speak, so that we were using Cube on our team and running our apps on it and kind of getting uh, a perspective of what their user experience looks like. So that takes us to what our current cube architecture is like. And this is pr pretty much what happens when any a team, when, when any time a team comes to us and says, hey Paz, I want to do some uh, containers, and we say, hold up, start here. And everyone has to complete um, our PaaS labs, as we call them. Um, they basically run through uh, all the features of the platform, um, basically what it takes to start using them, how they can make your team as successful. Um, the Cube Lab is our longest one. It's Lab 27. Um, and it walks through the provisioning of an entire, entire Cube cluster in Scalar from the creation of the farm, the farm roles, um, launching the farm, and then deploying your first app. Once they do that, the second step is a requirement for every cube cluster that gets stood up after that. Um, they submit a Jira ticket to us. That kicks off a build job that builds all uh, of the required, all of the required uh, secrets and tokens like the kubectl token, the kubelet, a bootstrap, a token, their teams, a token for their team's console, ACL policy, um, API to server certs, and stuff like that. And then it puts it in our, our secrets backend, and then the team gets supplied with a namespace of, of where to find all those things at. Um, then they take that, they go, they build their farm. Um, if they're a new user or a new team, they'll probably be doing that in, in the UI, which is lots of pointing and clicking. Um, if it's a more advanced team, it's definitely being done um, automated in their uh, CI pipeline. 
This is a really bad drawing of what our cube kind of looks like right now. Um, some things to note here are we are uh, masochists, and we basically roll our own uh, cube RPMs using the Google binaries. Um, we're not running them as containers themselves. Um, and that's for everything in the cube control plane and then kubelet and kubeproxy on, uh, on the workers. We run SED in its own cluster. There, it's usually always a three node, a quorum, but for some of our bigger clusters, um, we go up to five. And then we put HAProxy, uh, which is heavily orchestrated in front of uh, all, all the worker nodes, and then that gets updated with w w where to find the API server, and anything that needs to, to, to talk to the Cube API goes through that HA proxy. Uh, so we also have this really awesome API team um, on, on PaaS. They build all of these great tools in Go, um, and they had built a deployment API that was initially used for deploying apps uh, on cloud instances and managing that entire, the entire life cycle. So they built some new, some new functionality into it to handle like container deployments on a cube cluster. Um, basically, it's managing like three, three key things. It's taking uh, a cube a deployment object. So anything you could do in, in a cube deployment, you could do in our API. It just takes that, it deserializes it, and sends it to the cube API. Um, it creates a service to go with that a deployment, and it picks a node port from this uh, list of node ports assigned to that cluster. Um, then it goes and updates the HAProxy config with the IP addresses of all of the worker nodes in the farm and the node ports where you can find the currently a deployed version of your app and, and the new version. Then the user can use the API and start shifting a traffic um, however they want and however they are, are comfortable with. They could also do a canary deployment. They can just shift a little bit of traffic and then do uh, some automated testing with uh, a pass-fail mechanism in it. Once they're OK with the deployment and they say it's, it's good to go, they send a complete, uh, a complete message to the complete endpoint. And the API will go in and delete the old deployment and services and update HAProxy at config again. Or if it didn't go well, they could ask for a rollback and it'll just put everything back to the way it was before you started a deployment. Um, and this is really where Calico shines for us because HAProxy has no idea um, what node is running the a, a, a pod for the app you are looking for. So when it sends traffic to a node that doesn't have that port on it, Calico will come in, take it, and send it to a node that does. Um, so a cube is, 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 is really good at like abstracting all these things from people who just want to run uh, container workloads. Um, but I'd say that a benefit comes with a lot of added complexity from an operations standpoint. Um, there's a valid argument also that like whether or not taking on that added complexity is worth it at this point where where we're at to run some containers, but it's the only way right now on the PaaS platform that you can run containers. So we kind of have done the best we can to build up a tool set to handle uh, those issues when they come up and, and dealing with that complexity. One of those things is we run a server spec in our CI, CI pipeline um, against a fully running cube stack. Uh, we're checking for making sure that the system is configured right, and we're also checking um, actual functionality. Um, we're running a commands. We're checking the output of it. We're making sure everything in the cube system namespace isn't just saying it's running, but it's actually also working. Um, then we run some uh, canary clusters. So any changes that we make or new releases or if we update things in our cookbooks, we run them against a cluster that actually has apps running in it um, to validate those changes, check for any regressions. Um, it's not like perfect at catching everything because we can't account for all 
of the use cases that our, our users are uh, inventing in, in these clusters, but it does a pretty good job. Um, we maintain a set of runbooks. If you're not doing this, I highly su suggest it. Um, and not just for like the, uh, you know, the new person's first night on call. It's, it's really good just as a reference for the team. Um, we have everything in there from common uh, troubleshooting uh, techniques, also links to documentation. They are continuously updated. Anytime we encounter something that's just weird, um, it goes in there. And they're all in a GitHub repo, and then we link those to all of our, our New Relic alerts and our Victor Ops, like our paging services alerts. And then these last two things are kind of just like uh, our standard ops things. I think in the keynote yesterday morning, we heard observability engineering. I kind of like that term. Um, and this is kind of like in a, a cube cluster, which is different from our normal stuff. Uh, it's very dynamic and it's volatile. Things are being spun up and, and torn down all the time. So we shove all of our cube logs and our container logs off to our logging vendor. Um, this is also where it helps to have some good uh, namespacing and patterns up front. Um, and then we've designed and created some pretty nifty dashboards um, that our success team has even automated as part of the provisioning step when you're, uh, when you're building a new cube cluster. Um, this is just an example of what one looks like. Just standard worker stuff, you know, uh, CPU disk memory, and then just checking what, um, like all the important services on a worker are still there, like Docker and Kube proxy and Kubelet and stuff. And then we look at things like how many of a container and a version of that container are on uh, all the workers. We look at we look at the container distribution. That gives us a little bit of insight into how the bin packing is working. And then just some random I/O stuff over there. So. We did run into some challenges. Um, one of them was uh, we had problems with nodes terminating and terminating cleanly. Um, not only draining pods, but removing themselves out of a calico. Uh, so we didn't have routes to nodes that weren't, weren't there anymore. Um, we handled this by creating an orchestration script that Scalar will trigger um, before a worker node is removed um, and, and terminated in its cloud provider. And all it's really doing is it's hitting, it's hitting at the Kube API for its own node name. Then it drains itself. It, I think we have 120 seconds there. And then it will delete itself. And then it will stop a Calico node on that worker and then delete itself from, from Calico. And that runs every time unless the thing just dies and then you have to go in and manually do that. Um, we had some trouble with auto scaling. Um, there's like inherent ways that to do this in Kubernetes um, or you could just use your cloud provider. You know, if you're in AWS, you're using auto scaling groups. In GCE, you're using managed instance groups. Um, but there are, our chances are that you probably want to do things after the node is there and it, like post config management, post boot steps. Um, so for, for us, we didn't want to use user data or user scripts through metadata in GCE. Um, so we created our custom uh, scaling scripts in Scalar. Um, that Scalar will run on a worker node at a set interval. And then based on the output of that script, it'll make a scaling decision. Um, initially, on our, our smaller initial clusters, we were taking the average of those metrics. So when we got to the larger clusters, we started seeing that there were a few worker nodes that were just getting crushed, even though everything else was fine. So we rewrote those scripts to scale off of an individual worker's um, resource a consumption, and then we made those both available to our users, so whichever works better in, in their cluster, they could, they could choose. Um, we had some issues with contract limits. Um, this was kind of a race condition in our testing, because we were 
disabling a firewall D uh, in Chef and also in our pre-baked images. Um, but we knew that a Calico was running its own firewall D pretty much, but it was also reloading the net filter contract uh, kernel module. So it was putting back into play those sysctl contract limits. And we started seeing just random nodes in our larger clusters just dropping at TCP connections. Um, so we just bumped all those limits and added some pretty detailed alerting um, and monitoring to our dashboards. Uh, cloud parity, as much as Cube wants to be like, wants to abstract how resources are provisioned versus how they're consumed by a user, like persistent volumes, uh, a user should just be able to say, I need a 25 gig volume here. It shouldn't care if that's an EBS volume or if that's a GCE, a persistent disk, or it's NFS. But there's currently some issues here. We're, uh, we're getting bit by an open issue where if you set the cloud provider equals a GCE kubelet flag, um, which is required to get any of the GCE specific functionality like persistent volumes, um, and you're using a CNI plugin, it will still try and create routes in GCE, and then you'll have nodes come up that will be, say they're ready, but there's no routes to them. Um, the workaround right now is to not set a cloud provider if you're in GCE, which kind of doesn't work because then we can't use persistent volumes, then we can't use our staple sets. So having to tell our, our customers at this point that like you can use these over here, but you can't over here um, is not good for now, but it's supposedly supposed to be fixed soon, and that would be awesome. And this is probably what's been the most challenging for us. Um, our initial cube clusters were 1.4. Uh, we released 1.5, um, skipped 1.6, released 1.7, planned on doing 1.8, and now we're looking at 1.9 uh, probably in Q1 for us. Um, if we were just like a team working on just this, we'd probably be able to do it. But you know, we have a whole other platform to manage, and we're also we're also integrating a features into our cube clusters, like um, our our vault integration, our our console integration. So we're trying to get better at this, and we're looking at some alternatives that uh, can help us out with the pace of the development here. Um, so how do we do? Well, I'm still getting paid, and they let me come and talk th about this, so I imagine we did pretty good. Um, elections at 2016 was a complete success for us, broke all our traffic records. Um, about a week before the election, we went to our CTO and we said, we, we want to run 100% on Cube. And he had the faith and, and the confidence in us to do that. Um, and I think at one point around midnight, uh, one of the API layers behind the application was having some, uh, some issues. So they just threw it in a container and we deployed it on the Cube cluster and had no, had no problems. Um, we managed over 170 deployments that night, all successful, which we couldn't have done uh, if we were running this on the old, uh, old VM way. So it was a long night for a lot of reasons, but it was, uh, it was a rewarding a finish to a very challenging project and a very transformative a project for us. And I just want to talk about this up real quick because this is a little bit more recent. So our success team recently took uh, all of the desktop sites for all of our properties and moved them into uh, a Kubernetes, Kubernetes cluster. And that resulted in reducing our daily operating costs by several hundred bucks. Um, and they're looking at further optimizations there. Our deployment times went from fully optimized, getting all 140 sites out, uh, took over two hours, and now we're down to 25 minutes, and we could probably get even faster there. And during the recent uh, tragedies of uh, Hurricane Harvey in, in the Houston area and Hurricane Irma in, uh, in Florida, we dropped our paywall for all of the local uh, sites 
in, the, in those areas. Uh, so all the residents could get you know, the most up-to-date and accurate information that they needed to stay safe and informed. Um, we ended up making 1,500 of deployments during that time period, which again, we could not have done uh, the, the, the old way. Uh, so that was a pretty big win for us. And real quick, what's next for us? Um, we're eventually gonna finish our move to SCD3. Uh, Cube 9, like I, I talked about, um, we're relooking we're looking. We're, we're taking another look at Cube ADM. Um, when we first started this, it wasn't really ready, and now it's. Uh, it, it looks like it will help streamline our uh, how we handle our control plane with those gross RPMs. Um, Vault integration is actually live now. Um, we're using the Kubernetes Vault uh, off backend in conjunction with uh, a pre-configured role for that team. Uh, a policy for that team and then a role for that cluster. Um, if, if any deployment needs to access a secrets in Vault, you just add a Vault init container to that a deployment and then it'll mount a token um, with a very short a TTL uh, in a shared a secrets volume for any of the containers in that pod to access. We started looking at service mesh. We think it's really cool. We really want to do awesome things with it. Um, but no one's really asking for it. So it's, it's taken a back seat to some higher priority stuff. And last but not least, the elephant in the room are terrible, uh, not terrible, but are terribly over-orchestrated HA proxy per application ingress load balancer solution that we're looking at um, some cloud native stuff like using ALBs in Amazon or GCE load balancers or maybe something like uh, Envoy, but um, that's where we're at. So thank you for listening to me. Um, if you have any questions, uh, feel free to ask or find me or Dan or we're also hiring. So if you want to do cool, interesting things in, a, uh, in the news industry, come talk to us. And uh, that's it. Thanks.